You know, I'm well aware that there are some of the folks who have decided to regress this morning and go camping, and so they're not here today. God bless them where they are. I must say they're more hardy than I am, because when God gave me a house with air conditioning, I decided to stay there. There's no need to go out there in the wilderness anymore. Anyway, so it's really good to be back with you here again this morning. I appreciate it. We're always glad to be able to be at Light in the Valley and back to Holmes County and Berlin and all of those places. You know, it's just a wonderful thing for us, and I appreciate the opportunity. You know, I'm thinking this morning about a fellow that I met many years ago when I was holding revival meetings, and a fellow came up to me during the course of the meeting and said, could I meet you tomorrow for lunch? I said, sure, sure. And so we did. We met at a restaurant, and he had a problem. And his problem was this. He said, you know, Dale, he said, some days I feel like I'm saved, and other days I feel like I'm not. I'm vacillating between one and the other. I'm saved today, I'm lost tomorrow, I'm saved today, I'm... He, went, but he said, I'm just flopping back and forth, and I don't know what in the world's wrong. And it's not because I'm some great educated guy, you know, but the Lord came through at that moment, and I said, well, tell me how you got saved. And he said, well, it was a typical thing. You know, we had revival meetings in our church, and, you know, the preacher preached, and the Spirit convicted, and I responded. I went forward. He said, and then we went into the council room, and the, man, and the preacher came in and said, uh, okay, what have you done? He said, so I told him all my sins, and I got saved. And I said, no, 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 you didn't get saved like that. We are not saved by confessing our sins. We are not saved by following all kinds of traditions and church guidelines and things of that nature. We are saved by confessing Jesus Christ. And that's what happened to him. When he thought he got saved by confessing his sins, what that meant then was that if he happened to have a day when he wasn't all that great and all that successful at living for the Lord, well, then he felt set, then he felt unsaved or he felt lost. And then if he was having a good day where he felt really spiritual and everything was going well, well, then that day he was saved. The next day he was having a problem, so he wasn't saved anymore. And what I'm here to, this morning to tell you is that unless we have come to, to God by the avenue of Jesus Christ, we are not saved. And I want you to know that. I want you to take that with you. It's easy for people of our tradition, our cultural background, to equate following the church rules and following traditions and things like that with being pleasing to God. And that is not the case. I'm not saying none of those things please God, but what I am saying is this, that if we're depending on them to get our foot into heaven, we're depending on the wrong thing. Because if we supplant Jesus with anything else, no matter what it is, whether it's church rules, church guidance, whether it's good living or nice things to do or charities or whatever it is, if we supplant Jesus with anything, no matter how good it is, we are wrong and we are not saved. I want to point something out to you this morning from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7 is where we're going to be dealing from, but we have to go into Acts chapter 6 just a bit in order to set it up and to give you a bit of a context as to what we're talking about. Now, Acts chapter 7 is the, is the speech that Stephen made in front of the high priest and, of course, the, the entire Sanhedrin. And what was going on there was that it was the longest defense of the gospel. In order to, again, in order to be able to set it up and to show you for sure what's going on, we need to go back to chapter 6. And we had a problem. It, it's in the days of the early church, and it didn't take long for the devil to get in and create havoc and, and, and cause them to have difficulties and problems with things that, you know, that just seemingly ordinary things. And, and let me just tell you this. I'm not really sure... I know what it says here, but I'm not really sure whether these Grecian widows were being neglected as much as they thought they were or not. But if I've learned anything in all of my almost 50 years of being a pastor, a preacher, and in the ministry, I've learned this. I've learned that no matter how untrue it may be, perception is what wins. Perception. If it's perception, people would think perception is reality. And so if that's what they were thinking, then that was the problem. Whether they were really being mistreated and passed by or things like that, I don't know. But whether they were or not, the perception was there, and that meant it was real to those that were affected by it. And it says this, that in those days, when the disciples were... Uh, should have brought some glasses up here this morning, I guess. Is there a light that you can turn on here a little bit brighter right here on this for me? I would appreciate it if you would. I'll do my best here. Here we are. If I turn it just right, I can get it. Anyway, it says here that um, when the disciples were increasing in number... Um, a complaint by the Hellenists. Well, who were the Hellenists? They were the Greek-speaking Jewish people. The Jewish people by this time had been scattered all over the world, and had, many of them had come back to the city of Jerusalem, and, but they had all kinds of different cultures that were attached with them. They were all Jews, but they had a different background. Now, now we're talking, hey, that's wonderful. Let there be light, the Lord said, and it came right on. 
Uh, wonderful. Now we're talking. Uh, as we say sometimes, we're cooking with peanut oil now. Okay. But who were these Hellenists? Again, they were people who had a different cultural background, even though they were all Jews, came from a different area, a different place, and so forth. Um, they picked up different cultural values and different cultural norms, I guess I should put it like that. In the city of Jerusalem, during this period of time, there would have been about 500 different synagogues. How were they divided out? Well, we have some inkling of how that happened uh, when we get into the very next, uh, into the later, latter part of this chapter. It talks about a synagogue of the freedmen, uh, those of the Cyrenians, those of the Alexandrians, those of Cilicia and Asia. Uh, there were different cultural backgrounds, people who felt comfortable with each other and banded together, and that was their synagogue. And so they came from all kinds of places. But the problem here was that we had people who were Hebrews through and through in the same church with people who had a Hellenistic background, which means a Greek-speaking background. And it was a bit of a rub between the two. And the end result of that was that the complaint was that the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking widows, they were being neglected. That's what it says there. They're being neglected in the daily distribution, meaning the handouts, the welfare program, you know, that's what we're talking about, that kind of a thing, the very practical parts of it. And so we had a real problem here. Again, whether it was real or not, the perception was there, and that made it real, whether it was in actuality or not. But here's what it says they did. It says the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, Is it not right, it is not right, that we should give up uh, preaching the word of God to serve tables? Therefore, uh, uh, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. And so they did. They chose seven different deacons. Among them was Stephen. Now, it's interesting to me how they did this, because remember, it was the Hellenistic, Greek-speaking widows who felt they were being neglected, and in order to solve the problem, they appointed seven Hellenistic deacons to take care of them. So that nobody could complain, oh, you're still a Hebrew, you're still not doing the things you ought to be doing. They put seven of them in who came from the same areas, had the same cultural background, and so forth. And so it felt like they would identify with them, I suppose, better than anyone else. Now, as a result of that, as a result of that, it says here, it gives all the different names here. Stephen's the only one I'm concerned about here this morning. But it says it was a really good thing to do because it says the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. It was a good strategy. It was not right that they should give up preaching to take care of this. Appoint good men full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit. Let them take care of that. We will continue to preach. They did, and they had wonderful results. But among those who were appointed, this man Stephen seemed to shine out among the rest of them. We don't hear anything about the other six that I'm aware of, but Stephen, we do. It says in verse 8 that Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. He took his calling of God really, really seriously. He was appointed... He was put into office to take care of the widows, but his duties and responsibilities gradually came far beyond that. And it says here that he belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia. It says they rose up and they disputed with Stephen. Now, let me just tell you, Paul, Saul in these days, the Apostle Paul as we knew him later, was a Hellenistic Jew, a Greek-speaking Jew, and it is, it is possible, perhaps even likely, that he would have been among those who were debating with Stephen, and Stephen won the debate. Now, it doesn't always pay too well to win, because it makes you the object of someone's wrath, scorn, revenge, whatever. And so when they couldn't win the debate, the Bible says they went a different direction. It says that they secretly... Uh, instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And by the time they got the charges refined, the way they wanted them, these fellows came and they said this to those that were in charge of the Jewish, among the Jewish leaders. It says, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place, meaning the temple. He speaks against the temple. And he also speaks against the customs that Moses delivered to us. Two charges. What's wrong with Stephen? He's speaking against everything we hold dear. And he's speaking against this place that we hold dear. And that to them was blasphemy. And so they hauled him up in front of the, the Hebrew court. 
And then in verse 7, if you want a title of what we're going to be talking about this morning, and there already are, the title would simply be, Are These Things So? And that's what the high priest said. The high priest, he's sitting in judgment. He looks at Stephen and he says, Are these things so? And Stephen begins to talk. In chapter 7, he says it like this. <coughs> Excuse me. Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Now, before I go too far, let me tell you this. They tell us that when you're preaching, you ought to have a three-point sermon. Uh, some people disdain that. Others would do well to follow that so they don't go all over the place with it. Stephen does that. Stephen has a three-point sermon because they're saying to him, you're speaking against our law, our tradition, and you're speaking against this place, the temple. How do you defend yourself? And Stephen gives them three illustrations. The first one is about Abraham, someone whom they all held, held dear. He was the founder of the Jewish faith. He was the, he was the founder of the Jewish culture. He was, he was their father. No wonder he's referred to as Father Abraham, because that's what he was. He was the beginning of this whole thing. He was the first Hebrew, the first one. They revered him. They knew he was righteous before God. They knew that God had imputed righteousness to Abraham because of his faith. The second one that he goes to is a man by the name of Joseph. And they full well knew the role that Joseph had played and how important he was in their history. It was through his intervention in the land of Egypt that they even survived as a nation. And the third one that he invokes on them is Moses himself. Everything he said was true. Everything he said was indisputable. <clears throat> at any point along the line, he could have stopped and looked directly at the high priest and said, are these things so? And he would have had to say yes. Is it true that Abraham was called and he was not from Jerusalem when it happened? Um, yeah. Yeah. Is it true that Abraham found favor with God and it was without the tradition of the law? It hadn't even been created yet. Um, yes. You see his point? His point is here, you're saying that your traditions and your temple are the utmost. And he says, I am proving to you from your own history that the way to God is not through tradition and it's not through the temple. It is through his son whom you have rejected. That's what he tells them at the very end of his discourse. But for here, take a look with me. He tells them, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. That's not Jerusalem. It's not at the temple. Before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. And then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God moved him from there unto this land in which you are now living. His point would have been, he was in favor with God, and it didn't start here. The next one he goes to is Joseph. Skip down to verse 8, 9, I'm sorry. Where it says the patriarchs, that's the brothers of Joseph. The patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him out of his affliction. Egypt is not Jerusalem. I don't read where he did this. But wouldn't it have been really tempting at that point to stop and say to them, are these things so? Gulp, gulp, yes. Yes, that's right. God rescued him in Egypt outside of the law because the law hadn't been created yet, at least not in its written form. Huh. He rescued him. He gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. In fact, he gave him a new name. Remember that? He called him Zaphnath Paenea. That's as close as I can get to what it looks like on the paper anyway. Zaphnath Paenea, what does it mean? It means savior of the world. 
That's what Joseph was. Because when the Pharaoh had his dreams, had it not been for Joseph, who had a line with God and understood what the dream was and what it meant, had it not been for him, they would not have been able to take advantage of the seven years of plenty. They would have simply squandered it. That's what happens. Most people, maybe that's too broad, a lot of people I know, it really wouldn't matter how much money they made. They'd squander it all as if they didn't have but half that much. They wouldn't be looking ahead. But because of Joseph and what his interpretation of the dream meant to them, the Pharaoh took him seriously. And so for seven years they piled up the grain. And then when the seven years of famine came, they had plenty to eat. No wonder they called him the savior of the world. We owe Joseph a debt of gratitude too. Because it had it not been that he was able to provide for the continuation of the Abrahamic line, the Jewish people, we would have had no savior. Our salvation depended on this boy Joseph and God hearing him, God accepting him, God using him, although not in Jerusalem, although not with the law, but with his response to God when he reached out in faith. You see, Abraham was a favored person with God, and they knew it. Joseph was a favored person with God, and they knew it. There was something here that I hadn't caught before until I was studying this in particular, and I found it really, really wonderful that Joseph is known as the Savior of the world. Huh. Do you know when his brothers accepted him or when they found out about him? Because you'll remember that on the first trip, without going back to the book of Genesis and reading it for you again, let me call upon your memories. When Joseph, when Jacob rather found out that there was grain, there was food in Egypt, he sent his sons, with the exception of Benjamin, down to Egypt to gather food, to get food, to buy food. That was the first time. Even though Joseph knew who they were, he hid himself from them. I mean, he talked to them but they didn't know who he was. They were typical Hebrews with big scruffy beards. He was an Egyptian, shaven clean. They didn't recognize him. And furthermore, even though he could speak Hebrew, he didn't do it. He spoke to them through an interpreter. They didn't know who he was. That was the first visit. And on that visit, he inquired about Benjamin. Do you have another brother? Yes, we do. But well, don't come back again unless you bring him along. Remember the story. Finally, there was no other recourse but to go the second time, even though Jacob didn't want them to go. And, and, and Stephen pulls out a very important thing here in verse 13. He says, and on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. That one really struck me. The Bible says this in the book of John. He came into his own, talking about Jesus. He came into his own and his own received him not. And that's what happened. He was largely rejected by his Jewish brothers. In a sense, you could say they threw him into the pit and they sent him off to Egypt. That's what happened with Joseph's brothers. You know, in retrospect, it's a wonderful thing that they did throw Joseph in the pit and send him down into Egypt because it worked for their own salvation even though they didn't know it. It's a wonderful thing for us. It's also a wonderful thing, as terrible as it sounds, it's a wonderful thing that Jesus was rejected by his brothers and was placed on the cross. Because had he not done that, there would have been no salvation for us, for them, or for anyone else. On the second visit, when his brothers came back the second time, that's when he introduced himself to them as his brother, whom they thought was dead. It was the second visit when they came together. You know what? If you look in the book of Romans, I believe it's chapter 12. I'd have to look it up for you. Maybe it's 11. It says, And so all Israel shall be saved. The day is going to come 
when Jewish people around the world are going to recognize Jesus for who he is and accept him wholesale as the Savior of the world. There are revisionists, people who want to say the Bible says something different than what it actually says, who will tell you, well, that means the church. That stands for the church. I believe God is intelligent enough. If he wanted it to say the church, it would have said the church. It says, and so all Israel. And those are the Jewish people. You know any Jewish families, neighbors, business acquaintances? The day is going to come when they will value Jesus just like you do. That day will come. It's on the second visit, not the first one. The second visit. Well, we don't have time enough to unpack that entire thing, but that's the truth of what's going to be happening. And so it says here that Joseph sent, verse 14, he sent and he summoned Jacob, his father, and all of his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt and he died. He and our fathers who were there. And then they carried him back and so forth. All right. That's the second one. We have, we have uh, the examples given to us. Abraham was the first one. He was accepted by God. Are these things so? Yes. We have J uh, Joseph, who is the second one. And he was rescued by God. And he was used by God to save the world. Are these things so? Yes. He says, I have one more. I have one more. Someone who's very important. Um, whose name is Moses. Verse 20. It says, at this time, Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight. You can disagree with me on this one if you want to. It's not a matter of salvation. J. Vernon McGee used to say, if you want to be wrong, that's your privilege. I didn't say that, but he did. But here, he was beautiful in God's sight. What does that mean? Well, I choose to believe that in part, it means he was a beautiful, beautiful baby. Let me tell you, that was important. Why was it so important? It doesn't hurt anything for him to be just as cute as the buttons on your dress. If there is such, that's an expression. My wife always, when I start using some of these expressions sometimes, she says, what does that mean anyway? I don't know. It just sounds good, you know. That's what people say. It's just, a, it's just an idiom. That's just what it means. I know. Maybe I'm an idiot for saying an idiom, but that's the way it is. But it didn't hurt that he was really beautiful. Because when it came time for him to be rescued at the age of a few months, and Pharaoh's daughter came down to the edge of the River Nile, and they opened up this basket, and there was this beautiful, beautiful baby. That didn't hurt. You know... Um, I come from a family of 10 children. There's one brother that's older than me. I'm number two out of 10. This is before I was here, of course, but I've heard the story that when my older brother was born, he's the first one. My dad looked, saw him in the hospital and he went home and cried because he was so ugly. Truth to truth. Now, by the time I was born, they didn't say anything about that, so either they had gotten used to ugly or it didn't matter anymore. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. You know, in general, we think all babies are beautiful. They, they, every none of them aren't. I'm sure yours are, but apparently some aren't. But I was preaching in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania here some time back and mentioned this story. And afterwards, a deacon and his wife came up to me, older people, I think they're older than I am, that means they're, they qualify for old. And, um, and she said, you know what my husband said about our first boy? No, what did he say? And he was silly enough to try and defend himself after she said it. She said, he looks like a rat. She said, he looked like a rat. She said, I wanted to hit him. After all, I went through to bring that boy into the world, and you say he looked like a rat. And he hadn't learned his lesson in all these years. He, he stood there and said, well, he was all wrinkly and everything. He did look like a rat. So, you should quit while you're ahead, men. That wouldn't do any many favors. I'm just saying it doesn't hurt that he was really good looking. You know, 
after church on Wednesday, we have midweek services at home, and after church we almost always stop at a restaurant somewhere and, and eat. And this has been a long time ago now, but we were in a, re- in a Shoney's restaurant one night after prayer meeting on Wednesday night. And at a table right next to us was two ladies and a little baby. And that little baby was a doll baby. I, I mean, an absolute doll baby. Beautiful. But that child's mom, you wondered how this could be. She really needed help, and there was no way to help her. And Shirley's Uncle Harvey was in the group with us, you know, and he noticed the child, and he was right at the next table, and he would turn around in his chair, and he was playing with the baby, and, you know, and everything was going along really, really well. And all of a sudden, he looked at the woman, and he said, I bet that baby has a really good-looking dad, doesn't he? Do you ever wish the floor would open up and you could just fall down into some other world? And she was right with it. She said, oh, he does, he does. Huh. Wow. I wonder if she still remembers that I do. Anyway, it didn't hurt anything. And on top of that, you know, sometimes you hear babies cry and they're angry. They're obviously angry. In fact, there are times, I just admit, I'm human enough to tell you that I've heard some babies cry already when hearing them cry and I knew they were mad, it made me mad. Uh, It just affected me. But then there's also times when babies cry and they sound so pitiful, so pitiful. Your heart just rends in two. I believe this, and you can differ because it's not a matter of salvation. But I believe that when Moses was put into that basket out there in the Nile, in the first place, he was a beautiful child. And I also believe that God nudged him at the right moment, and he had the most pitiful, heart-rending cry that anybody could hear. And the heart of Pharaoh's daughter was immediately touched. Moses was on his way to finding favor with God. He was going to be allowed to live when other little boys his age were thrown into the Nile without the aid of a basket around them and the alligators had a meal. That's what happened to them. Not to Moses. And then it says this. He was raised, of course. It says here he was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and he was mighty in his words and deeds. And when he was 40 years old, he lived to be 120. His life is divided into three 40-year periods. The first 40 years in Pharaoh's palace. The second 40 years in the wilderness following sheep around or walking in front of him or taking care of sheep. His father-in-law's sheep. He didn't own a single one of them. And after 80 years of age, he came back and rescued the people of Israel from Egypt and spent 40 more years in the wilderness doing what he had to do with them. But here's what it says. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. Remember about the Savior, folks. He came into his own and his own received them not. Remember that when Joseph's brothers came the first time, there was no connection between them. No connection. It was the second visit when they connected and Joseph did his work among them. In this case, it says here that when Moses made his first appearance to his brothers, he supposed that they would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand. They did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them. He's back out there again. And they were quarreling. This time it's not an Egyptian and a Hebrew, it's two Hebrews. They're quarreling. And he tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And Moses ran for his life, because he thought, Surely this thing is known. After spending 40 years in the wilderness going to God's Bible school, God appears to him in the burning bush. And then in verse 34, God tells him this, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. 
This Moses, here's what Stephen says, this Moses whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. Are these things so? Yeah. Yeah, they are. So what does it take to be saved? Does it take worshiping in the temple? Does it take the law? The traditions of men created from the law? Is that what it takes? It's too bad. But I have met over... If I live until December, it'll be 50 years that I've been preaching the gospel. And in that 50 years, I've run across a lot of people who would be very comfortable with you telling them, just, just, give me the, just give me the rules, would you? Just tell me what I can't do and what I can do. Just, just give me the rules. Give me the ordering. Give me the, you know, give me the guidelines of the church. Just, just give me something to go by. And, 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 and that's, that's all I need, you know? And if I can, if I can do that, then I'm going to be okay. No. No. I don't know how you do it here, and I'm not critical any way you do it. But years ago, we, I got, when, when I became the pastor of our church, I took to heart what it says, that so let a man examine himself, and then you go to communion. So let a man examine himself. We used to have council meeting. When it got more spiritual, we called it preparatory services. And what it amounted to was having a sermon and then pull out the guidelines of the church and go through them. You know the strangest thing? I don't ever remember being asked, how's your prayer life? Do you pray? How much Bible reading are you doing? Do you read the Bible? How precious is, what's your church attendance like? I never ever remember being asked a question of a truly spiritual nature. It was how long are your sideburns? It was how short is your haircut? It was what kind of a coat do you wear? Folks, as precious as that may be to some folks who really follow tradition, I want you to know that is not how you get saved. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. It's been a few years ago now. I told you I came from a family of 10. There's only seven of us left. One of my younger sisters came down with cancer here a number of years ago. And when she was, when she was brought into the church, she was a member of the church. They never went, but she was a member. Because it was back during the days when she came up through her teenage years, it was during those years when there was sort of a tradition the church would have revival meetings, and during those revival meetings somewhere, a whole row of the same age people would get up and go up and supposedly con confess Christ and go through instruction class, be baptized, brought into the church. Whether they understood what they were doing or not, I, I don't know. I'll leave it with them. But this sister of mine was in her 50s, and she had cancer. And it got worse and worse, and... You didn't have to be a doctor to know that time was getting short. And because they didn't go to church, I was as close to being a pastor to her as anybody was. And so Shirley and I went to the hospital twice a week to visit her, uh, to pray with them. They didn't want to talk about dying. They didn't want to talk about anything like that. I just wanted you to pray. It was sort of like they thought maybe, maybe I could pray and God would work a miracle, irregardless of commitment or whatever. You know, that's what it seemed like. But I always prayed. And then she went into the intensive care. And now we, we know we're getting close. And I told Shirley, that we're going to go see her. And tonight, we're going to have this discussion. Where are you with the Lord? No more praying for healing, asking for God's blessing. Where are you with God? So we went in, and they led us into the intensive care unit, and there she was in the bed. In all the years that I served as a pastor, whenever I'd go to visit somebody in the hospital, if they were sleeping, 
I would let them sleep. Sometimes I'd leave them a note and say, I was here, you were sleeping, so forth, whatever. I just never felt comfortable waking anybody up. So here we go into the intensive care unit. She's laying there asleep. And I looked at Shirley and she said, say her name. And so I called out her name, Annie. No response. Do it again. Annie. And she woke up. She looked at me and right away said, I need to get right with God. So what would you tell her? What would you tell her? You knew she only has a few more days at most. What would you tell her to take her safely into heaven? Would you go to 1 John 1, verse 9? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is that how we do it? No. You see, I, I didn't think, in my mind, I didn't believe that she knew at all what it took to be saved, to be assured of being in heaven. I, I wasn't sure she had ever known what that was all about. And so we went to the book of Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You see, 1 John 1, 9 is for the Christian who's struggling and he's backsliding or he's having problems living victoriously. Then confess your sins. God will forgive your sins. But that's not how you got saved. You didn't get saved with the temple and you didn't get saved with the traditions. If you're saved sitting here this morning, it's because you named the name of Jesus and put every hope you ever had in the name of Jesus. And so I went through it about confessing Jesus. And I'd stop, just little bites. Do you understand that? Yes. Yes, I understand that. Yes. So we got all done. And I said, Andy, now you need to tell God what I told you, what we've talked about. You need to tell God. Since I'm older than her, I knew her ever since she was a baby. I knew her characteristics. And I was so sure she was going to say, why don't you do it for me? I was so sure she was going to say that, but she didn't. When I said, you need to tell God, she said, okay. Closed her eyes and began to pray. And I was astounded. She went through it point by point by point by point. That she believed. Believed in Jesus. That God sent him, that God raised him. She confessed Jesus. And I believe heaven rejoiced. Three days later, she was called. I told that story at her funeral because I wanted people to know. And after that, somebody, somebody refuted it. You mean she didn't have to confess her sins? That is not how you're saved. I know things about some people who felt like they needed to confess their sins. I wish I'd have never heard it. I don't need to know what you've done. I need to hear you say, I believe in Jesus. There's a man that I pray for every day. He's an older man up in his 80s. And he is not a Christian. He goes to a Monday night church. His wife is a member. He goes with her. But he's not saved. And in talking to him over the years, I've become convinced that he must believe that, there's, that in order to be saved, he's going to have to say everything he's done. And I want him to know, and I keep praying for him to that end, believe in Jesus. It's Jesus. It's not confessing my sins. It's not that. It's, I'm not telling you that's never necessary, but I'm saying that's not how you're saved. None of us will get in that way. You know, there was a pastor of the Mennonite church that I grew up in who also had her on his heart. And the very night that we were in there and she confessed Jesus, he told me later, he said, you know, I had also decided this is the day when we're going to have to have a confrontation. 
And he went in to see her too and started in on about getting right with God. And she stopped him. And she said, remember the day I was here? I'm okay. And he said, Dale, you could see it all over. She was okay. She was okay. Well, again, it's because she confessed Jesus that I expect to see her in glory. Well, this is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt. That happened over and over in their wilderness experience, them wanting to go back to Egypt where the leeks and the garlics were. Plenty to eat and all of that. Funny how your memory fails you. Anyway... He lets them understand that, listen, you folks have done a terrible thing. He says, as your fathers did, so do you. What does he mean? He says, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. And when they heard these things, they were enraged. And they ground their teeth. They stoned him to death. And it says that Paul, or Saul, stood by and guarded their clothes and watched it happen. Folks, I would ask you again this morning, are these things true? Is it true? Sure it is. When these fellows were presented with everything he had given them, there was nothing he said that they could refute. Was it true about Abraham? Yes. Was it true about Moses, Joseph? Yes, yes. Is it true the way they treated the prophets? Yes, it's, it's all true. It's all true. Is it true that my hope of eternity is based on Jesus and Jesus alone? There's a song, In Christ Alone, My Hope is built. My prayer is that that's yours as well. If you've been leaning on tradition, if you've been leaning on any church guidance rules or anything like that, if you've even been leaning on the idea of confessing your sins and thinking that gets you into heaven, confess Jesus. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Tell somebody else you believe it, and you will be saved. Heavenly Father, Thanks. Thanks for Jesus, the Savior of the world, who has come and given his life so that we might have life. Lord, may there not be a single one of us here today who leans on anything except him, Jesus, our lifeline to heaven, the one who took our place when we should have died, he did it. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.